As always, I appreciate those that keep coming back to these uh, daily conversations. This will be available as an edited conversation under that Lead Lag Live name on all your favorite platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that stuff. All the uh, prior spaces are up to be a favorite and also rate and let people know about these conversations, given that it takes quite a bit of effort and I don't really make anything on it. With all that said, my name is Michael Gayet, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour is Mr. Franklin Parker, who I had on, I want to say almost a year ago, and quite a busy man. I think he and I are aligned on a lot of things here. But Franklin, for those who are not familiar with your background, introduce yourself. Who are you? How did you get interested in markets? And talk about some of the research that you've done. Sure. So uh, just in a nutshell, I started, I cut my teeth in the uh, just retail wealth management business. I got into that business in 2007. And I thought, this is great. Easiest job in the world. Everything goes up. No one complains. And then 2008 hit. And I thought, what am I doing? I got to go do anything else. But I, I'm not in, fi- I wasn't in finance originally. Like my background is in music. So I came out of music, pivoted into finance and, um, so I spent post 2008 just giving myself an education in finance and trying to to really answer some basic questions. Like my basic question coming out of 08 was how much can you lose in an investment portfolio before you've lost too much? And it kind of sent me on this intellectual quest and I found this line of research called goals-based investing which is all about solving the portfolio problem when you have specific goals to achieve, timelines and minimum wealth requirements, all that stuff. And I thought, okay, I found my people. So I started publishing actively in that space, peer-reviewed papers, trade publications, whatever. And that is still a core piece of research for me. I just released a book on the topic a couple of weeks ago, which is exciting. But we meandered through the family office space. So I was a chief investment officer for a family office for a while. I have, still have a foot in that world because I spent almost a day there in their capacities. And so I have worked around very wealthy families for quite a while and, and still count some of them as as clients today. I left a few years ago and started my own shop. So I I now manage money both for very wealthy families as well as uh, kind of more mass affluent folks. And I found that you and I are actually quite aligned on a lot of stuff. We we seem to come to similar conclusions, but from different directions, right? So I'm like a macro guy. I'm always looking at just the macroeconomic data and kind of allocating across the business cycle and, and you know, I know that you have some of that in your blood too, but you also tend to be a bit more of a technical guy. And I, I read your stuff and I'm like, I, I sometimes chuckle to myself when I think it's amazing how often we, we sort of come to the same conclusion from different angles. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but <laughs> there's definitely a degree of uh, confidence <laughs> bias on that. All right. So, so let, let, let's go back to some of the things that you, you mentioned. So uh, if you're a cynic, you'd say, well, you know, the, everybody's goal is simply very simple to make as much money as quickly as possible. So let, let's get into a sort of what exactly goal setting is from a portfolio management perspective and, and why that matters. Yeah. So in the abstract, that's kind of true, but in practice, it's not, right? What, what we care about is what money can do for us. We don't necessarily care about numbers on a statement. I mean, mentally, when you're looking at numbers on a statement, you're translating in the, that into what that can do for you, right? Like, can, can I retire? Can I go to college? Can I buy a vacation home? Can I buy a private jet, whatever your level is, that's what you're converting those numbers into on a statement. So you're not really managing money in the abstract, right? At the end of the day, you're managing money with the idea that one day I'm going to convert this this savings into consumption. And that is a critical variable that is different for individuals from institutions. So institutions never die, right? An insurance company can wait through 2008 for their risk to be rewarded. A pension fund can wait through 2020 for their risk to be rewarded. If you're 68 and you're planning to retire in December 31st of 2007, 2008 is absolutely destructive for you if if you don't manage the risk properly, right? And that has been a problem is that people don't manage their risk within the correct context. It's different managing risk for institutions than it is for people because you die one day. And taxes also matters. There's some other things that matter uh, that are different, but uh, but that's fundamentally what's going on here is just the time horizon piece. But yeah, it's funny you mentioned the the example of somebody being 68 in 2008. If somebody was 68 buying bonds late last year, this was their 2008, just not in equities, right? It was in the bond market, and you know, you and I both know traditional finance would argue that the conservative investors, older investors, should be more tilted towards you know some degree of fixed income. But it seems like that's actually been, you can argue, the riskiest thing imaginable with high inflation. So how do you factor in 
periods like this, which, although they are rare, can be quite consequential. Yeah, well, I mean, your capital market expectations matter, right? Like, so, so there's two pieces to the equation. There's the big world, which is mostly what we talk about in finance. So interest rates, is Apple a good stock? What's the political risk? What's the Fed going to do? Like, those are all the big world of, of the opportunity set. But then there's what do you need doing in your world? And that's what I just got through done talking about, which is, you know, I want to retire, send my kids to college. And where those two things overlap is good investment management for real people, okay, rather than institutions. So you have to have an opinion on both. And good capital market expectations yield better results, all else being equal, right? So, so for example, over the last several years, I, I've been aligned with that thinking, which I'm like, bonds are extremely risky. I mean, at some point, the Fed is going to be raising rates. You can't really take them much below zero. Of course, then Europe did that. And I was like, well, okay, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but feeding in your capital market expectations and saying, look, bonds are going to return practically nothing. I mean, it was not exciting for me to go buy an Apple bond at half a percent interest. I, I would just leave it in cash. What's the point? So you've seen a lot of that from a lot of people, not just me, over the past, I would say, eight to nine years, bonds have just more, or at least long-term, high-quality bonds have really been shunned. You've seen a big cash inflow into short-duration stuff. You've seen a big cash inflow into higher-yield stuff. And then, quite honestly, you've seen people move up the risk spectrum searching for yield, right? That's, that's why we saw all of these cash flows into, well, uh, I want to be careful here. But I, I think it is one reason why we saw a lot of cash flows into, you know, private equity, venture capital, angel investing. We saw valuations there expand quite a bit, and then we also saw asset classes become viable that in any other market environment would not have been viable, and maybe the the more arcane corners of the cryptocurrency space, stuff like that. We've had, you can argue, a. a- lost decade now already in bonds, right? With the speed with which rates have risen, the destruction in uh, a lot of these bond funds, you've already had also a lost decade in emerging markets and use the term correctly, you know, opinion on expectations, capital markets expectations. Because, you know, listen, all of us are just basically giving opinions. Nobody knows what tomorrow brings, right? Any forecast yeah, is also an opinion about tomorrow, right? So what what's your sense of, uh, or I should say, what is, what is your opinion on the next 10 years, because if you're going to be goals based and have a long term horizon, you don't care about this year or next year. You care about really the next decade of investing. Do you think that what we've seen with bonds, what we've seen with many international equities that we're in that kind of moment now for U.S. markets or are we going to continue to be kind of an outlier? Yeah, good question. So first of all, it's not necessarily true that you're only concerned with the next 10 to 20 years as a goals based investor. Your goal is you're very concerned with just next five years, right? You know the the your capital market expectations have to start aligning with your with your time horizon, and that will be different for every objective. So, uh, and how you manage risk in each of those matters, right? So, what's the cost of me being wrong? You know, maybe this is what I think is going to happen, but if I'm wrong about that, how do I kind of hedge away some of that risk? So, it's, it's a complicated problem, but but yeah, I, I my personal take is that we're going through a goofy economic transition, really, for the next three to five years at least. We're, we're coming out of this 15, 18 years of Federal Reserve and, and really global central bank intervention that may or may not change. I, I, think, I think central banks are trying to get out of that business. Whether or not they will be able to is going to be a big question over the next three to five years. And my favorite example of that is Japan, right? So, you know, Japan is about 30 years ahead of us on this economic experiment. And you know, in the late 90s, they took interest rates to below 1%. They started printing money in an attempt to revive their economy. Now, to be fair, J- Japan has other problems. They, they have some demographic problems. Uh, they have some kind of cultural headwinds to entrepreneurship, things like that, that, that slow the dynamo of their economy just a bit. But you can't deny that, that they have been doing this money printing, zero interest rate policy for at least a decade before we even started it in 2008 through 2000, well, through through now, basically. And they have not been able to get out of it. They've tried several times. Every time they go to raise interest rates, you know, the the market and the economy pushes back on them. And so I, I don't know if, if we will be able to exit this economic experiment. We, we may be stuck. So I'm watching very closely for that. But 
I do think the Fed and the other central banks globally want to get out of this business. And that's going to mean it's, it's going to be a goofy economic time where a lot of these asset bubbles deflate that we've seen in assets that are painful, like housing and also stocks. And then there's some political consequences to that that I think that are going to be tough to deal with. So, so it's just going to be goofy for the next three to five years. A lot of volatility, I think slow growth, but, but generally more or less positive growth. I, I do think we're going to see a recession in the next year. But after that, I think we'll get a little bit of growth. So it, it looks to me kind of like the early 1980s in a sense. Yeah, I know obviously a lot of investors here are in the US and a lot of people will reference Japan as sort of a you know poster child of getting no returns. I don't actually know myself, but uh, you know, my assumption is that there must have been throughout the last 20, 30 years some investment plays in Japan, either certain sectors or industries or individual stocks. So even if we are headed for that Japan like scenario, there presumably will be some opportunities. It's just gonna be a lot harder to find. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, the good thing, the thing that I'm most excited about is that for the past, the, the past 15 years, those of us who manage risk for a living, which are professionals, right? So amateurs are obsessed with making money. Professionals are obsessed with managing risk, right? And both upside and downside risk. But um, for the past 15 years, those of us who manage risk for a living have been rewarded for that activity, right? For that expertise. Really, you could just throw money at just about anything and it was going up. And that was because of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve sucked all, all risk out of markets. And my favorite example of this is the difference between Expedia.com and Booking.com coming into 2020. So well, stop me if you've heard this one. But Booking.com and Expedia.com, both in the similar business, you know, they're both, you go online, you book a trip. So in 2019, Booking.com tapped all of their credit lines, borrowed into debt markets, and did nothing but buy back stock. So in January of 2020, this company had zero cash and zero ability to borrow. Expedia had, had a better ba- had managed their balance sheet better, right? Had a better income statement, had a better balance sheet. They, they were just in better shape altogether. They weren't great, but they were certainly better. So COVID hits, right? Everyone realizes the travel industry is out for at least a year, if not more. And immediately investors price booking.com down 90%. Like that, that's, I'm going out of business. That's, that, that's what that price means. Now Expedia got hammered too. They were down like 60%, but not as bad. That wasn't like an, I'm going out of business. That's like, it's going to take a while for us to recover kind of situation. Okay. So, so everyone's like booking is going out of business. The federal reserve in late March steps in and opens the corporate bond buying program, which by the way, was the bottom of the equity market when they announced this program, because they said we will be a lender of last resort to large cap U S companies. Well, if you take bankruptcy off the table, what is an equity investor worried about, right? So by sucking risk out of the market, the market started to rally and booking.com shot back up, right? It was still down from its high. It was down like 30 or 40%. But almost immediately, investors said they can't go out of business. So so now booking is worth more than Expedia. And, And in all reality, that's probably a company that shouldn't exist, but does because of the Federal Reserve. And if you were a professional looking at balance sheets and income statements and assessing risk, you would say Expedia is the better bet, right? But you were not rewarded for that bet because there was a third party acting in the market that really took that that discernment away from you. So, you know, I am excited that we're now entering an era again where risk management matters, where, you know, your skill set to discern between high quality and low quality matters. And that means that those of us who do that for a living finally are able to add value again. Let's go to uh, some of the audience here. Yeah, that's a great question. I I guess you should know that I have a general cynicism about this business as a whole, having having worked in it for so long. I will say that like in the- Can can I just say before you finish that, I I have not only- I not only share the cynicism, I think everyone is is beyond fucking ridiculous in this industry. Most people are just- (laughs) No, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Most people are salesmen. They're not really- yeah. intellectually curious about markets. They don't study. They do, don't do back tests. They end up getting tremendous assets because they're going out golfing and taking all their clients out to these fancy steak dinners while schmucks like me are hosting Twitter spaces. <laughs> yeah. So I want to draw a firm distinction between wealthy families and family offices and what I would consider kind of the retail wealth management space. Okay. 
So let, uh, maybe let's start there so I can we can bifurcate this conversation. So very wealthy families, and I'm talking people with well over 100 million in net worth, okay? And, and typically more in the 500 million to at least a billion in net worth. That is a separate category of investing and management than what the, the what most people interface with, okay? So so let's set that aside for a minute because the the way those those folks organize their investments, think about problems, think about the world in general is distinctly different than how the rest of us do. So we, we could talk about that, but I want to set that aside. So when you're talking about just kind of like your financial advisor that's managing your retirement account, your IRA, I mean, I'm 100% aligned with Michael that 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 is a business that is based on marketing. And I, in my experience, some of the most successful advisors are not successful because they're very curious about markets. The amount of time that you would spend researching is time you should be spending talking to prospects, right? Like that's that business mindset. So you get a lot of kind of the same, the same things repeated over and over again. And that's what kind of, that's what I was reacting against after 2008 was, you know, I was parroting the kind of quote unquote financial advice that you were supposed to say. So, you know, don't worry, it'll come back. Just buy and hold forever diversify your stuff, right? And I remember in October of 2008, not even cash was safe. Gold was down 20%, stocks were down 30% in just October. And money markets were in danger of breaking the buck. So you had nowhere to hide. You couldn't even go to to cash, basically. And I, I was, it was really this kind of created this intellectual vertigo. And that's what sent me down this path of, does this even, is this even good advice? Why do we say this stuff, right? And so... The bottom line is, is that when you're talking to your financial advisor, you can find out pretty quick if they're really just a sales guy or if they're somebody who has a deep knowledge and concern about markets and how they apply to you, right? Th- those two things have to come together. So you, n- you need a firm understanding of markets, but you also have to understand what it is that you're trying to do with your money. And you know, when you talk about managing risk, well, that's a conversation that will quickly come off the rails with the sales guy because their version of managing risk is we're going to diversify. When markets lose value, we're going to rebalance because you know that automatically buys low and sells high and all the things that that we say in this business, which is true, by the way. And, and that is that is a defensible strategy unless you're going to need the money in the next couple of years, right? In which case, okay, maybe it's not a defensible strategy because now I can't accomplish my goals. And I, it's just not me. Like I'm a business cycle guy. So I just want to make sure that we're out of the way of the freight train before it hits us. Even if you're not close to your goals, because if I can build up cash ahead of time, that means that means that I have the greatest luxury in the world. We, we can use this downswing as an opportunity to, to get you closer to do rather than just mark time, right? Of course, that, that adds a different kind of risk. Maybe I'm wrong, but at least we're being thoughtful about the problem rather than just being marketing guys, kind of parroting cliches. I will say this, like, I do think that when you're talking to kind of retail wealth management guys, and and I'm not, I'm not trying to disparage everyone here because there, there are some gems out there. There's some folks who really are trying to do a good job. The view there is that we are going to manage your existing wealth. And the objective is not to get rich with this. The objective is to keep you wealthy, to preserve your wealth and grow it and to grow it conservatively. Okay. That, you know, public markets are not a place that you're going to get rich. And that's an important distinction because, you know, only I'm, I'm a big believer that really only you can make you wealthy. If, if that's your objective, if you, you, you know, want to, want to knock the cover off the ball and, and build something valuable, only you can do that. No one else is going to do that for you. So you have to, you also have to kind of think about, well, well what's the role of this person in my life? Uh, if, if they're helping me retire and they're kind of managing my money in a way that, that keeps it there and manages my liquidity and we talk often and we have some good ideas every now and then, okay, fine. But if you're viewing this person as someone who is going to give you like, you know, three X returns in five years, well, that's just not their role. They, they are not going to do that. Only you can do something like that. No, that, that is a very important point. Those are why, you know, despite all these so-called gurus and day traders that you see on FinTwit, the reality is most of them are either full of shit or they got very lucky with some very levered bet. 
I mean, that's just the reality. It's very hard to get rich from investing in a short time frame. You can argue maybe over a long enough time frame, sure. You know, you, as long as you outpace inflation, compounding kind of does its magic. But there's also just in fairness, Franklin, that you mentioned, which I think is worth pointing out, which is that even if you do find that steward of capital who understands the markets, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be better than anybody else, right? Because, and this is the other thing, which is maybe not a very popular opinion, but I think is true. Nobody has control over investment results. You have control over how much risk you can take. But nobody ultimately can – it's not like the, the more work you do, the more likely you're going to have you know, one and a half times the, the, the S&P's performance. There's no clear link between effort, due diligence, and you know, much higher risk-adjusted returns because we're all subject to cycles. Yeah, that, that is true. I mean, like I said at the top, you know, all, all we really do is manage risk at the end of the day. And, and you're managing upside risk, which is the risk that markets run away without you. And you manage downside risk, which is the risk that you're in and markets tumble, right, at the wrong time. So you're really talking about probabilities and you're talking about, you know, very unsexy things like, you know, relative risks and relative returns and correlations. I mean, you're talking about boring stuff. It's That's why nobody writes a TV show about finance, financial guys, right? Because you're just going to see them like staring at Excel spreadsheets all day. That's very boring. <laughs> And most it's, people don't want to do not, that It's not work. slow money. It's fast money, right? It's not slow money. It's fast money. Yeah. And no one wants to do that work. Or, I mean, few people do. And if you do, it's because you're intellectually interested. Yeah, it, it's very maddening because you, you have to be, you know, we have to all be concerned with the size, frequency, shape, and color of the Fed's latest bowel movement. You know, it's just, it's maddening. I, I hate that part of the job. It's not what I got into business to do, right? Um, to just read between the lines of the Fed's every statement. But that's what you want to do. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, frankly, I think it was CFA level two where they talked about bowel movement by the Fed. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I think that was in, uh, in corporate finance level two. Yeah, it's, it's maddening, but it's something you have to follow. You can't fight the Fed. If, if you try to, I mean, they are the thousand pound gorilla in the marketplace because they have unlimited money and they don't care about price. Right. They care about some sort of economic outcome, which is separate. They, maybe markets are just the markets to them. Well, not always, but are, are almost always just a, a side effect of, of whatever it is they're actually trying to accomplish in the economy, like the real economy. OK, so markets have been like the side effect of their policy has been that markets have seen massive expansions in price to earnings ratios. And in fact, I did a study on the Well, a study in, in air quotes on the role of interest rates in P.E. ratios. And I actually just tweeted it. It's from my personal website. But if you kind of want to understand how P.E. ratios and interest rates interact, this is a good start. But interest rates affect P.E. ratios. And it's because the, the fundamental equation in finance is the, the discounted cash flow equation. And interest rates are on the bottom. So if you increase interest rates, you, you, you take future cash flows now suddenly become considerably less important and cash flows today become considerably more important. So when you take interest rates to practically zero, there is no difference. Wh whether you make money today or whether you make money 10 years from now, it's all the same in the equation, right? Uh, so that expands PE ratios massively and, and really quite absurdly. And if you look at kind of just resource allocation in the economy over the past 15 years, there, it's no it's no coincidence that interest rates at zero have fueled a massive expansion of venture capital in technology investing, right? So the story of technology has been just build something. You can worry about revenue later as long as you're attracting a community and you're kind of creating users and you've, you're gaining customers. We don't care if you're a loss-making enterprise forever. And that there's no coincidence. It's because, look, we can wait 10 years. Because who cares? What's the difference? But now we're in an environment where you know the discount rate is four to four and a half percent, and suddenly those valuations are compressing quite rapidly and massively. And it's because okay, now now we care. We you need to suddenly become profitable because we can't wait five years for you to be profitable. So that that is really the biggest change. I mean, the Fed influences PE ratios in markets, but then there's a there's a secondary effect which is of zombie companies. And there was a good study done in 2018, I think, and I'd have to go back and 
and look at it. I can tweet it out later. But it was it was looking at the number of zombie companies and the correlation to Federal Reserve policy. So a zombie company, just in a nutshell, is a company that does not earn enough revenue. So revenue, which is the very top line, does not earn enough revenue to cover the cost of their interest payments on their debt. All right. That's pretty extreme. Like you, you have more debt payments than you even earn in revenue. Okay. And at the time, in like 2018, something like one in five companies in the United States was a zombie company. I mean, that's insane. And you think about the, the amount of resources, and I'm not talking just about capital, but also um, how much labor are these companies absorbing from the economy? How much like just computers and basic infrastructure and real estate are these companies absorbing in the economy that could be put to more productive uses, but don't have to be? Because, you know, we, the, the, the Fed is, has created easy money and, and, you know, there's always more cash to be had and uh, interest rates are at zero. So whatever, you can just always keep funding them as investors. So that's going to go away. And I, I think that's going to be a positive change, but it's going to be a lot of pain between, between now and when the change realizes. So look, there, there's a lot of consequences and a lot that we probably don't even know because the economy is an immensely complicated machine with very nonlinear inputs and outputs. And so guessing at this is really difficult. So I tell people, look, I I can see about six months out. That's the extent of my weather forecast. I can tell you if there's a storm brewing on the horizon and kind of which way the winds are blowing. And and we can kind of chart a path for the next six months. After that, we're all just kind of opining. And that's fun to do. I enjoy it. But I don't put any weight in that. Yeah, and we'll definitely uh, touch on on the book and the process and writing it. Uh, everybody's here. Please make sure you follow Franklin Parker here on Twitter. He also has a, a white paper that he put out that uh, won the Founders Award. I forget which year it was. Franklin, forgive me. Seventeen, I think. I, I've, I'm starting to forget too. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's part of aging. Uh, this again will be an edited <laughs> podcast soon enough on your all your favorite platforms. Again, if anybody wants to come up, click on that bottom left micro request button. Okay, so I don't believe we're going to see sort of a lost decade, at least from here. Now, maybe from the S&P's high, I don't know, but I don't believe we'll see a lost decade. And, and partly because the US economy is a very robust uh, machine. I mean, it's, it's chugging along most of the time and we don't think about it. I mean, every time you go into Walmart and buy stuff or Target and buy stuff or on Amazon and buy stuff, I mean, you, you go to work and they pay you. I mean, those are all, that's all part of the economic dynamo. And people are still doing that. Right. It, 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 what you need to worry about is when people stop doing stuff like that, like they stop going to work and they stop buying stuff, and people stop getting paid. That's when the dynamo is really starting to blow up. So, you know, I, I'm a believer that I think long term, a long term bet on the health of the U.S. economy is, is probably a good bet. Right. Probably. Maybe not. That may change. OK, but let me let me take a step back and I'm going to just talk for a minute on this idea of reversion to the mean, kind of buying the dip. That, that kind of idea. In a world where the Federal Reserve is not part of the market, which again, may or may not be the case, okay, but that's the key variable. If you take the Federal Reserve out of the market or any central bank out of the, the local market, you have an environment where buy the dip doesn't necessarily work all the time. And I don't believe in reversion to the mean. That's just not how markets work in almost any instance. It's like VIX, right? So you look at the volatility index, the VIX, People always talk about, well, it's mean reverting. No, it's absolutely not mean reverting. It's on or off, right? It's binary. It's either high or it's low. There, it's never at its mean. It never returns to its mean. And it's the same with the S&P. Like you're, you're either in an environment of kind of, and I'm going to use this word in air quotes, you're in an environment of catastrophe or you're in you know, smooth sailing. There, there really is no mean in that. And those are two separate markets. And you have to think of them as two separate animals. So, okay, what animal am I dealing with here? Am I dealing with a, a bucking bronco at a rodeo? Or am I dealing with my horse that I see every day and just petted last night and gave some oats to, right? Those are two separate animals and you have to approach them differently. So understanding kind of the market regime that you're operating in is very important. So, you know, my personal view, again, like when I kind of read the tea leaves and kind of peel back the, the fundamental economic data, Things have really deteriorated over the past, say, month, and it's really been in the past month in the economic data. So, you know, we got retail spending last week. It's contracting, which is not good. Industrial production has really slowed down quite a bit. Uh, you've got 
like PMIs are now in contraction territory. So manufacturing is contracting. We're seeing kind of a slight tick up in unemployment. Now, unemployment, I tweeted this a couple of weeks ago. Un- headline unemployment is not necessarily what matters. If you overlay a 12-month moving average and then look at how that you, how that compares to recessions, when the headline rate crosses above the 12-month moving average, that's a pretty good recessionary indicator. That just happened in the last unemployment report. Now, it takes a little bit, but that's that's usually a good sign that a recession is not too far away. The GDP output gap has closed and contracted, so that's also one of the early recessionary indicators. You got the yield curves have inverted, again, recessionary. So you kind of go down the list and you're like, I'm having a hard time finding things to be excited about. This is looks to me like a time to hunker down and start preparing for a storm. So we're, we're about to be in an environment where buying the dip outside of the Fed being involved, you know, may not, may not be a valuable strategy like it, like it has been over the last 15 years. Let's go back to the name of the space, Franklin, for a bit here, how the very wealthy invest. I think some people would argue that the very wealthy are basically not really investing in public markets. They're doing it through private equity, through VC, that they get access to special investment opportunities through illiquid type of assets like watches and artwork. Um, do you think that uh, that that is correct, that that's sort of a, a big differentiator between the very wealthy and the rest of us? And if it's not, what are some of the other ways that the wealthy do invest that we can maybe learn from? Yeah. So that's a huge topic and uh, we could spend hours on that, but um, let me just hit you with kind of some of the highlights that, that I've noticed. So I was raised what I would now consider lower middle class, right? We, we were, we weren't in poverty, but, but you know, we weren't super wealthy. So I was taught the, the power of thrift, right? And this was one of the first things that I noticed that was different about the very wealthy is that, you know, when, when I was raised, it was, it was like, look, get a good job, save your money. If you want a beach house in Florida, you save your money for 30 years, you're financially disciplined, and then you can retire to a beach house in Florida. And I, I'm not poo-pooing that advice, by the way, that's very valid advice, but that's not how very wealthy people think, right? The way they think is, look, I want a beach house in Florida. Okay. Let's get some buddies together. Let's go find some capital. We'll all put a, you know, an LLC together. We'll put this beach house in the LLC. We'll fund it. We'll get borrowing put it on Airbnb. And now we've got a free beach house in Florida today. Right. And like the, this idea that the world is malleable, that you can actually make it whatever you want. I mean, what do you want? Decide on that and then just solve the problems until you've got it. That kind of thinking is totally different than when I was raised. Cause I think those of us who grew up kind of in, in at least middle-class lifestyles, you know, we were taught that the world is kind of set right? Like there's some boxes you got to check in the world and there's some landmines you got to avoid. But as long as you do those things, then, you know, then you'll get your rewards in life. And that's just not how the world works. I have, I have come to learn. So this first idea that the world is malleable is I think the most critical, right? And you really can create the world around you that you want given enough time, effort, energy, and and even capital. Okay. That's, that's the top line thing. But when it comes to actually investing, it is a completely different world for the very wealthy than it is for the rest of us. So first of all, the SEC and its infinite wisdom makes it illegal for people who are not accredited, so there's a certain threshold for accreditation as an investor, to invest in a lot of really the fundamental dynamos of the economy, right? So like venture capital. You know, if if you're an investor with half a million dollars and 20 years of experience, you cannot invest in venture capital like the very wealthy can. You just don't. It's illegal for you to do it. It's not that you can't get the deals. It's just not legal. That's a problem. I think that's a regulatory problem that really needs to shift. And I, I talk a little bit about that in the book about why that's important. But that occupies as a significant chunk of of most wealthy investors' portfolios. Public markets are viewed as a liquidity management tool more often than not. So they're not really looking to get a ton of alpha out of public markets. They're really looking to, and I'm going to say this knowing that this is not compliance approved and in air quotes, but it's more or less like managing cash, right? We would just want market returns. That's fine. And, and then if we get a little extra, that's good. But for the most part, it's the money that, uh, that we're going to need here in the next few years or in the next decade that's that's parked 
in public markets. And then the third thing is, in a lot of cases, these folks run businesses, right? So a significant of their a significant chunk of their capital is tied up in the family's business, and maybe they run it or they've hired somebody to run it. But that's usually where the source of their wealth is coming from, and so that's obviously occupying the the largest amount of their psychological energy day to day. And then they will allocate to things like hedge funds or you know alternative asset classes from time to time, or the, you know their buddies doing a real estate deal, they'll throw some cash at that. There's stuff like that happens a lot too, but that's usually on the margin. And then when it comes to art, I do know personally families who invest in art, but invest in is not really a good way to think about it because art is a is an interesting market where what like one family I know of, they're kind of a famous art collecting family. And they will find and identify young artists and then basically start buying up all of their work at forty to fifty thousand dollars a pop. So anything that they produce, they'll buy it. And then over time, increase that price. So like the first five years is really them just seeding this artist. And then now this artist has a proven market, right? So now other people are starting to take notice and they're like, oh, well, that's interesting. Look, and their art has gone up in value over the past few years. So now other people will start to buy their art, right? And they kind of have launched this artist into the world. And suddenly their art is worth half a million to a million dollars a pop. And then they have the early work. So they can go back and say, hey, we've got all the early work of this artist. Who's interested in buying that? So that's a different market. Most of us don't have that ability to kind of be the market maker for artists. And the people who make money on art, that's really how it works. There's this image that like you go gallivanting across Europe and you identify great art and that's underpriced. And no, but it doesn't work that way. (laughs) It's a, it's a different marketplace entirely. And and, uh, the rest of us should, should stay away, at least as an investment. Let's go to the book here for a bit, Franklin. You sent it to me. I, I admittedly have not read it yet, but it's on my desk. Literally, I'm looking at it as we speak. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for those that write the book that I republished for my father. Even just writing the forward took me a long time to kind of put it together, and I'm a little bit of a perfectionist with this stuff. I can't imagine doing a, a full 300-page type of type of manuscript. Talk about the process of writing the book, why you wanted to write it, and what are some of the things that you learned as you were going through the process? Because the reality is, I have to assume you have an idea, but you always end up learning more as you start fleshing the idea out. Yeah, it was an interesting process. You know, like I said, I, I've been publishing on the topic. Uh, so I published my first peer reviewed paper in 2014, and it was concerned with that question coming out of 2008 I talked about earlier, which is how much can you lose in an investment portfolio before you've lost too much? like you can't recover in time to hit your goals. And so I I published a paper on that in 2014 because I found that nobody else had the answer. And I was kind of hooked after that. So published several papers after that and have really tried to drive the ideas forward. And again, the core idea is, you know, investing when you have goals to achieve. And a goal is technically defined as a time horizon. So I have so many years or months or whatever to achieve it. I have a minimum wealth level. This is the amount of money I need. And then, of course, I have a certain amount of money today that I can dedicate to it. So when you start putting those parameters around the portfolio management problem, the entire math changes. Okay, And it's taken a long time for the academic world to catch up to that idea. And really, it's only been in the last decade. So the first thing that changes is we get away from defining risk as volatility. So no longer is the purpose to balance higher returns with lower volatility. That's not necessarily the objective when you have goals to achieve. Suddenly, the only objective is minimizing the probability of failure. So what's the probability I don't have this amount of money in this amount of time? Okay. And then how do I balance that with my other goals? So, you know, if I fund, if I buy a vacation home today, the probability that I'll have enough money in retirement drops. Well, how much of that are you willing to accept to fund the vacation home today, right? So there's all these trade-offs that we make at the same time. And then what's even crazier, and this is what's the most fun to me, is that we all have these goals that, you know, they're kind of aspirational. Like if we, if we got them, that'd be, that would be awesome and it would completely change our lives. And if we didn't, who cares? I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. So that's why people buy lottery tickets. And I don't necessarily mean like, like, I go down to the convenience store and buy a lottery ticket. I mean, that's why people buy 
call options that expire in two weeks on, on a deadbeat stock, right? That's why people go out and invest in meme stocks. Okay. That's, you know, you're not, well, you shouldn't be putting your retirement funds in those lottery tickets. You're doing it because if it pays off, your life has changed, right? And if it doesn't, well, I haven't lost any sleep over it. So that idea though, is in traditional investment and economic orthodoxy doesn't exist. Like you should never gamble. And I, I show this in the book, the math of the problem, if you change the model and you change the math, it very clearly shows that there are times when you should gamble. Now, not everything and not all the time, but there are times when it's perfectly rational to do that, right? And understanding what those parameters are is an important piece of making sure that you're not just gambling away everything. So th there's a lot of outcomes of the theory that, that are really kind of exciting and, uh, and may even, and not, not to get too deep in the weeds here, but may even start to bridge the gap between like normative economics, which is concerned with how you be rational, right? how, what you should do to be perfectly rational and behavioral economics, which says, yeah, but people aren't always rational. Okay. There may be a bridge here to say, well, if we just model what it is people are trying to do in the world, maybe people aren't quite as irrational as we've always thought. You know, maybe they actually are acting in a way that's in their best interest. So, you know, I cover that in the book. I cover the fundamentals of the problem. I've got a lot of code examples on my website that, that link back to the book to like, if you actually want to look at how the process works, you know, here's how the sausage is made. You know, I posit a little bit on the future of, of investment management, the future of wealth management, what the industry is going to look like in the next 10 to 15 years, which I'm also very excited about. There's a lot in there. And for even those who are not, you know, technically minded or, or super quantitative, I think you could, there's a lot of the narrative that you could still pick up. You could just skip the math and you'll still kind of get the, the gist of the ideas, which I, I think are exciting and fun. So I don't know if that answered your question. I started rambling there for a minute. No, no, no. That's good. And I have it in the, in the pinned thread at the top here that asked so, or pinned tweet, get my wording messed up here. Oh, oh you, you said something and maybe it's kind of a good topic to close off the space since you use the term gambling, do you think that we're at a period now where there are many more people that are gambling than investing? And I say that because the whole zero DTE option thing blows my mind. The, the amount of day trading nonsense that I see blows my mind. And I see it not just from retail. I see it from those mm -hmm. in our industry. Yeah, well, you know, we live in a golden age of investing and finance. And that is both wonderful and terrible. I mean, if you can think it, if you can think of a trade, someone's probably already done it, number one. And number two, there's a mechanism out there to execute that trade. Now, there's a tyranny in that choice. And what you have to realize, I kind of liken it back to you know, my days when I, was, when I was working in a family office. So one of the things was deal flow. So we would be looking at private deals. And there was a separate guy in the office whose kind of responsibility was that. but. Um, you know, he was looking at two to three private deals a day, right? And the objective, or at least our goal, was that we would probably do, we would actually fund one deal every other month. So we'd maybe do six deals a year. And realistically, of course, during the time, this is a time when valuations are crazy, we were probably doing one or none. So that shows you like just, just that funnel of, of stats, the amount of things that you can look at out in the world, <laughs> you got to narrow. You have to have some process to narrow that down and say, okay, yeah, but these are the things that make sense to me, and these are the things that I want to do. And then you narrow it down even further, and that okay, so these are the deals that within that context make sense, you know, and these are the deals that I'm actually going to run due diligence on. And it's the same thing with trades or investing or whatever. I mean, you have to find your niche, you have to find your corner of the market, the things that you're good at. And you really have to focus on those things. And it's easy to get distracted and try other stuff. But if you stay in your wheelhouse and you kind of develop an expertise on this one thing, or maybe just a handful of things, then over time and on average, you'll, you'll put the odds in your favor. But if you're out there just blindly rolling the dice with stuff, again, there is a role for that in your portfolio, but you should not be expecting that the odds are in your favor at all. You know, those are very low probability events and they need to be very high payoff to make sense. Right. So, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of 
crap out there that people are doing that that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But I guarantee you somebody's getting wealthy on it. And it's it's probably the house. I mean, it's probably the market maker who's getting wealthy on it. And the rest is just kind of marketing and luck. Yeah, you know, I, I, I maybe there's something that I could put together as a, as a research paper, even with you on this. But I would suspect if you looked at investor returns in the 90s, they probably are higher than investor returns in the era of QE. Because you had higher commissions, you had more friction, more slippage, people were less tempted to trade. Whereas now, you have zero commissions, You and I'd argue that that's actually the worst thing possible because it encourages that gambling mentality. So mm. you probably have much better performance you know, having having barriers than, than frictionless trading. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And you know, especially the market makers and the brokers who develop the technology. They use a lot of the techniques that casinos use to keep you engaged and keep you kind of pulling the, turning the wheel, right? There's a lot of blinky lights. There's a lot of sounds. There's a lot of kind of quick dopamine rushes. It's the way, I mean, if you look at a gambling website and you look at like an online trading platform, they look very similar. And that's because they, the market maker makes money when you trade. And so their encouragement is not necessarily to help you make money. Their encouragement is to get you to trade of what you're doing with information. And you have to have some sort of coherent strategy. And the strategy will tell you what to do in every environment, in every moment. If you have a question about what should I be doing right now, that's that's an indication that you don't have a coherent strategy. And that has to be your first stop before you even engage with public markets. Because look, markets are famously unforgiving. And you can easily get yourself in, in a world of hurt, especially today with the trading instruments that are available to you. If you don't know, you know, if you don't know what you're doing with them and you don't know how to trade them and you don't know like how to, you know, what, what your coherent strategy is. Couldn't agree more on that. Everybody here again, please make sure you follow Franklin Parker. Check out his book as well on his Twitter thread. But thank you everybody for joining and appreciate your time here, Franklin.